Back on the podcast, happy to be joined this week by Daniel Jeremiah of NFL Network. Um, you know, he's the guy who I really trust the most of all of, and look, the draft has become a cottage industry, very, very much so. And um, I just, I respect his ratings and I respect his opinions for a very simple reason. I know how much people in the game respect Daniel Jeremiah. So Daniel, it's great to have you on the, uh, on the pod this week. Oh, it's great to see you, Peter. It's hard to believe like the, uh, I feel like the gap from when the season ends to when this whole thing cranks up, oh it's, it's, it's completely gone. It's gone. Well, think about it. We're recording this on Saturday. Uh, it'll uh, be posted either late Monday or Tuesday uh, as the combine begins. And as we record this on Saturday, the Super Bowl was 13 days ago. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's borderline absurd. You know, hey, you know, before we start this, Daniel, I would really love to ask you what your overriding feeling was watching the Super Bowl, watching these two great young quarterbacks. One of them drafted, uh, I think I'm going to write in saying these, one of them dra drafted 10th. One of them drafted in the 50s and, uh, you know, just really without any question, they're going to be great players barring injury for the next 10 to 15 years. What do you think of the Super Bowl? What do you walk away from the Super Bowl thinking? Well, I, I walk away, you know, with my own thoughts on it, Peter, and then they were echoed by my conversations around the league. You know, when you talk to friends and they're sitting there saying, how how are we going to stop these quarterbacks? You hope you have one of them, yeah. um, but if you don't, what, what we have to go. A, we got to go find one with an upside that's that's at that level. And then the second question, and this has been in talking to some GMs, like in their draft meetings, and literally the questions are: Is this guy going to help us get off the field against Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen? Is this pass rusher going to help us get off the field? Is this corner going to be able to hold up against these guys? Um, and building your team towards trying to deal with the this next generation of star quarterbacks particularly in the AFC. I uh I think that's a real interesting way to look at it and as we get into this um the one thing that sort of my overriding thing and I always ask you this because I'm not a big college football watcher the first time I ever start thinking about the draft is when I have this conversation with you. And then when I go to the scouting combine, which I'll do uh, this coming week. Uh, so I don't know anything. I come at this, you know, basically saying, okay, I know who Jalen Carter is, but I don't know if he's really going to be great. I know who Bryce Young is, but how do I know? So sum up for me, if you can, Daniel, what you think about the quality of this draft and maybe where it's strongest? Well, I, I think it's an interesting draft in that the the top end of it doesn't have maybe what we've had in years past in terms of the elite high-end players. Now, I, I love Jalen Carter. I love Will Anderson as the defensive guys. But when you put those two guys, those are my top two players after that, I mean, I think there's holes and questions on just about everybody. And, you know, it starts with the quarterbacks even with Bryce Young and all those quarterbacks in this draft. There's there's five of them, I think, that are going to end up being starters. Um, but they all have flaws. They all have holes. They're, in other words, there's not a Trevor Lawrence. There's not a Joe Burrow. There's not an Andrew Luck. There's not one of those guys where you come into it saying, okay, I, I'm, I feel really, really confident about this one. So I, I think there's, uh, you know, there's some – discrepancy around the league in terms of how you're going to have these guys ordered maybe more so than than any other year that I can remember um but in terms of the positional depth uh some positions are really strong it's the best tight end group um I've seen in the last 10 years it's exceptional there's so many guys there's tons of talent um the running back group is really deep um the uh, interior offensive line group is solid uh, in terms of the depth as you go through it then you go to the the defensive side of the ball. I think it's a really deep group of corners. Um, I think it's a deep group of edge rushers um, in terms of the value there on the defensive side of the ball. So those are kind of the the strong positions. I would say receiver is not, for me, it's not up to what it's been over the last few years. We've had just an unbelievable run of talent and guys that have come in and made an immediate impact. 
I don't think we have quite that um, that high end group of wide receivers that we've seen over the last handful of years. So would you say it's fair as I look at your uh, board, you know, your your top players, not the mock draft, your mock draft 2.0, which is out. But as you look at uh, your top players, four of the 15 top players, four of the top 14, actually, are the top four quarterbacks in this draft. So mm-hmm. you have the quarterbacks ranked fairly high, but you say all of them have their little issues. Yeah, and, and the reason why they're that high is because the players that they're surrounded by also have concerns or or issues as well. And then you just go to the positional value and say, okay, well, if they've got concerns and issues and holes, you know, the quarterback has the potential to have the biggest impact. Um, so you know, the way I kind of look at the the quarterbacks to some degree is if if they're going to be lottery tickets if you're going to go to the store and buy a lottery ticket you might as well buy the one that has the biggest potential payout and that's you know kind of how I look at where I stack these quarterbacks because they're you know while there's risk involved I do think these guys have really really high upside across the board let's let's do a couple of things that I want to make sure I get to okay yep so I, I want to ask you about each quarterback individually what you think of them and where you think they might be a little bit suspect. Let's start with Bryce Young of Alabama, who right now you have number three on your board. He's a, he's an unbelievable player. Um, And in terms of like, what do you like about him? It's almost like, what do you not like about him? When you watch him on the video, you see somebody that's, you know, you talk about the, the important characteristics of a quarterback. He's got poise. He's got uh, excellent accuracy. He's a really good decision maker. He can make plays within the framework of the offense. He can make frame uh, plays outside the framework of the offense. Uh, when you talk to the people at the school, they rave about his football intelligence. They rave about his work ethic. You now they talk about him. You know they would they would have a scouting report on Sunday. So you play a game on a Saturday, they give you the scouting report for the next week's game on a Sunday. Most people and most normal college quarterbacks, they'll they'll get to that on Monday. Um, they'll watch the tape with everybody, and then they'll have time to process that and maybe have some thoughts on it. They said he would show up Monday morning having already studied the entire uh, opponent tape and would come in with corrections and ideas on the game plan, saying, I actually like this protection against this one better. I actually like this this route combination this week. And they said a lot of times they adopted those opinions. So, you know, the work ethic, the intelligence, Every, every box he checks, Peter, it's just, he's not big. Um, that's the knock. That's the concern. And it's not really six the height feet tall, right? Yeah. I think he'll probably be under six feet tall is the expectation. I know I'm talking to the, to the place where he was working out, uh, as of yesterday or the day before he was 198 pounds. So he's put on some weight. I think there's a chance he could be at 200 by the time he tips the scales in Indy. Uh, what did he play? What did he play at, at Alabama? I think he played in at around 190. Um, at Alabama. So that's, uh, you know, he's added a little bit of weight there, but he doesn't have a big broad shoulder frame. I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing him in person. I have yet to see him in person. Every evaluator that I talked to and, you know, they know what I think of him as a player. And they said, okay, well just be aware. Don't be jarred when you see him. Cause it's almost, it'll make you step back a little bit when you see him, he's not big. Um, so that's his, uh, that's his knock there. It's just whether or not he can physically hold up. Remember the first time I ever met Russell Wilson in training camp with the Seahawks in 2012. I remember he he said to me, "Hey, uh, am I bigger than Breeze?" Uh, and it, you know, so obviously these guys know it's an yeah. issue, yeah. and they've been pounded in the head about it. So obviously that's going to be his biggest issue. Um, <laughs> Let's go to your number eight overall player, C.J. Stroud, quarterback, Ohio State. Yeah, C.J., um, I thought he he made improvements from last year to this year. Um, In in terms of simply arm strength, I thought he threw the ball with more velocity this year on on drive throws. He's a pure thrower. Like, if you want to watch somebody go out there um, and throw the ball on air, in terms of the ball comes out of his hand, it's a pure motion. Um, He spins it really well. He's accurate. Uh, when he's on schedule and on time, he's really good. He can make every type of throw. Um, he's not real dynamic or urgent or explosive in terms of his movements. 
Um, and you wanted to see him. I wanted to see him play, you know, a little bit more off schedule. In other words, when he got moved off of his spot to be a little bit more productive, I thought when you could move him and get him uncomfortable, I thought his play suffered. And then, of course, he goes into the playoff game against Georgia, and and it's the best I've ever seen him play and making plays off schedule, moving, having to move off that spot, create, make things happen. Um, you know, and it's kind of the old scouting adage of if you can do it once you can do it. So, you know, it's, it's in there. I wish I would have seen more of that throughout his time at Ohio state. Um, but in terms of just being a, a pure thrower, uh, processing, well, getting the ball where it needs to go accurately. He's, uh, he's excellent. You know, and it's six, three, he's not going to have that height question. Um, I've seen, you know, I watched a couple of his games this year. And, you know, I watched the Michigan game and obviously that's probably not the best game to watch. But what I thought was really interesting about him is that he really looks like a confident football player. Mm -hmm. uh, he he does not have he has he has very, very confident movements. You don't see him with the happy feet. Uh, I just. I when I looked at him, I said, "This guy won't surprise me if he starts opening day wherever he goes." Yeah, I mean, you're you're the wordsmith, so stoic was kind of one of the words that that I wrote down when you watched him. Like he's he's not going to be budged or or moved or and not going to. He's very comfortable sitting in there, and to some of that, I almost wanted to see him be a little bit uncomfortable, where I can see him take advantage of some opportunities that might be out there with his legs. But he is. He's very firm and he's very confident in the pocket. Your ninth rated overall player from Kentucky is quarterback Will Levis. Tell me about Will. Yeah, Will's a you know is a tough evaluation. Uh, when I watched him over the summer, um, I liked a lot of things that I saw from him. You saw him move around a lot better uh, the previous year. He was healthy. This year, he battled a toe injury, battled a shoulder injury. Um, he didn't run nearly as much, wasn't as productive as a runner. Um, the, the scenery changed around him. The offensive line was better last year. They lost a couple guys to the NFL. Um, you look at the, uh, the receivers around him. He lost his, his top, his top guy, you know, got picked by the giants and Wandale. So they, um, the talent wasn't great around him, but when you watch him, you still see every type of throw you can make, he can do it. He's got a really strong arm. You know, when he's healthy, he's a good athlete. The two things that you got to navigate around are the turnovers, you know, the combination of, of fumbles and interceptions, and then taking a ton of sacks. Um, so that's one of those things where in this role that I'm in, it's harder. Um, I would love to be with a team to be able to bring him into the room, to be able to go through all these turnovers, go through the sacks, and let him explain it. Because when you watch it, you know, there's times where I think, okay, this, you know, this looks like a wide receiver might have busted. This looks like the offensive line might have screwed up a protection. Obviously, there's going to be a good number of those that are on him. But uh, I think it's going to be a valuable combine for him, even if he didn't, you know, put on shorts and go out there and work out, just meeting with teams and being able to kind of explain some of those things that you saw on tape. I I like where you have him going, number seven to the Raiders. Because, and look, we still don't know what happened with Derek Carr and Josh McDaniels, but I can tell you that Josh McDaniels coaches guys hard. Yeah. He coached Brady hard. And I think, and you talked to Brady, and Brady appreciated it. Mm -hmm. And I, <clears throat> I think this guy, everything you just said is the very limited amount that I heard. You know, you got to figure out why he makes some of what appear to be unforced errors. Yeah. You've got to stop him from making those, obviously, or else, you know, he's not going to be good for very long. And I think the Raiders is a good place to go, especially if the Raiders re-sign Jarrett Stidham, because mm -hmm. I think Jarrett Stidham proved late in the year last year that he can be at the very least a placeholder for a little while, maybe even for his rookie year for Levis's rookie year. So I kind of like him going to the Raiders. Yeah. You know, I, I think you got to have a, a plan with him in place. I think probably early on um, provided he's healthy, his legs will be a little bit more part of his game um, and maybe try and limit him a little bit in terms of the number of times you really want to throw it to start out with. Um, but you've got a lot to work with. 
you know, the last quarterback that we'll talk about is a guy you have rated number 14 on your uh, on your list. Anthony Richardson from Florida, who uh, there's evaluations of him all over the board. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the the thing where you'll find people be unanimous in their opinion on it, though, is if you said all of these four quarterbacks reach their absolute potential and get the most out of what they have that he's at the top of the list. I mean, he, there's more there. The the size, the athleticism, the arm strength. You know, I, if if you're an alien spaceship and you landed and the only, you know, the you only watched the Utah game of his of his season and and watched that game, you think he's the best football player on the planet. I mean, he's he was unbelievable in that game. But, you know, the consistency is just not there. It's a roller coaster ride that you go on. Um, but you know, there's some other good games. It wasn't just a one, you know, one game deal. Missouri, he was pretty good. Um, but then you've got games where he just sprays it all over the place. The accuracy can really, you know, come and go on him. Uh, the decision making, he tries to do a little bit too much. I think he's somebody that if he would have gone back to school and just kind of continued on his progression, I think he'd be a slam dunk, you know, top five pick next year. And when it's all said and done, as we go through this whole process, he might end up being a top five pick this year because people are going to say this is this is all there, and and we we're confident we're going to be able to figure it out and get it out of him. But you know, been watching tape for a long time and studying players for twenty years. When you're playing against the likes of LSU as a quarterback and you have eighty yard runs, and you're playing in the SEC other SEC games, you see fifty and sixty yard runs from the quarterback who's six four, two hundred and thirty five pounds. That's not normal. Um, so there's uh, there's a ton of talent in there. Yeah, very interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about the premier players in this draft. Okay, you have Jalen Carter, your top-rated player. If the Bears hang on to this pick, it seems incredibly logical that that's who they would take. Why do you love Jalen Carter? He's he's can take over the game and just be a complete disruptor, even if it doesn't necessarily show up on the box score. He draws so much attention. He creates such havoc on the inside and you can line him up all the way across the, the line. You can move him around and play him anywhere. And, uh, you know, his change of direction, his explosiveness. It's pretty elite. I mean, I I loved Quinn and Williams coming out, had a huge grade on Quinn and Williams. I think that there's similar ability here. I think Jalen Carter actually is a little bit better athlete than Quinnen uh, coming out. So um, that's the type of impact I think he can have at the next level. You have Willie Anderson, your top rated edge player, and you like a lot of edge players in this draft. So tell me what you think of Willie Anderson. He's your second rated overall player right now. Yeah, I mean, he's it's not anything new with him. You've seen it when as soon as he got on the field at Alabama, I thought he, you know, established himself as a dominant player. You know, he's really, really explosive. Um, you see it in his hands. You see it in his get off. You know, his quickness that he possesses is, is pretty outstanding. He's not a Von Miller type athlete at the top of his rush in terms of his ability to really bend the edge and, and kind of wrap around. But he's got so much twitch and so much power in such a short area um, you know, it, that, that makes him a nightmare to deal with, uh, in the passing game. So, um, I'm anxious to see him in person, see him move around. I know when talking to, you know, the, the facility where he was training, one of the things that, that I enjoyed, one of the stories I thought was, was interesting is if you've watched these guys at training facilities, they'll do a lot of drills where you've got a band wrapped around a player and you've got a coach that's attached to him. And so that player's running and the coach is resisting and he's behind him. And this, this trainer's been doing this for a very long time. And he said he had more more horsepower than anybody I've ever done that with. Like you can wow. feel him when he takes off and goes, you, you you can you can feel that jolt. Wow. You know, I'm I'm just I'm really interested, you know, in in how they go at the top of this draft because clearly if you need an edge player, you know, I think you and you had it in one of your mocks you know you had Tyree Wilson of Texas Tech who on your board is mm -hmm. the second best edge guy but you had him actually being taken ahead of Will Anderson why was that yeah I, I think it's entirely possible and you know sometimes in mock drafts I'm just trying to prepare people of what 
could potentially happen. And it was right. last year. Last year it was when we were having this conversation. It was Trayvon Walker. And, you know, get to know the name. I know, you know, people think he maybe he's going to go in the middle of the first round, but he's got some rare, rare traits. And the upside is is something that a lot of teams are going to chase. And don't be shocked if he goes high. Now, when we had that conversation last year, I think he would be 1-1. No, um, but it was a name that people needed to get more familiar with. And that, to me, Tyree Wilson's going to be kind of that person in this draft where he's got an NBA like wingspan. He's enormous. He's long. He's really athletic. Um, and he's got more production than Trayvon Walker had quite honestly, you know, in college, you've seen him do it. So, you know, I, I think there's teams and talking to some teams that is a closer, that's closer between him and Will Anderson um, than maybe a lot of people on the outside would expect. I always thought one of the weirdest things really was that Trayvon Walker was the first player picked in the NFL draft and he never was first or second team all SEC. <laughs> and I just said, something is wrong with this picture. You know, I don't know what it was. And look, I was, I was pretty impressed with him mm. last year at Jacksonville. He is a, a little bit of a, of a game wrecker. Now, you know, he didn't play great all the time, but I, toward the end of the season, when you're watching Jacksonville a little more, then you know why Trent Baalke went out on, on such a limb for him. Yeah, and I think he's still trying to figure out as a pass rusher. You know, the thing is, normally yeah. you take a guy with the first overall pick, you want more production, you know, in that department in a passing right. league to be able to rush the passer. And I thought Aiden Hutchinson was clearly ahead of him coming into the league, and it shouldn't have been a surprise that he's ahead of him after year one. But I think with that yeah. pick, they're betting on what's going to look like year three. In the remaining time we have, I want to ask you about two other things you have uh, when you rank the players, regardless of where you think they're going, but the best players in this draft. Mm -hmm. Number four on your list is a running back, <laughs> B. John Robinson from Texas. And that one really slapped me in the face. Why do you have a running back fourth overall? Well, it's the grade that he gets, you know, and when on a grading skill, when you're with a team, the grades are a lot of times, you know, attached to verbiage, right? So if you're talking about somebody that's got a chance to be a top five player at his position, somebody who is not only a, you know, a pro bowl caliber player, he's an all pro caliber potential player. Um, those are the type of uh, words that are attached to this grade that I gave him. It's the same grade I gave him as the same grade I gave to Christian McCaffrey. Um, it's the same grade that I gave to Saquon Barkley. Um, so these guys are, you know, yeah, and we can, you know, it's a long debate. If you want to do the running back thing, do you take him? Do you not take him? You know, that's a long, long debate and people are well established on, uh, on where they stand there. I'm just saying as a player, how he grades out, he grades out to me as the fourth highest graded player of the draft. Here's the other guy who, you know, even somebody who's a numbskull about college football, I paid a lot of attention to last year. It was Jordan Addison. Mm -hmm. He's the wide receiver who transferred from Pitt to USC before last year, uh, was a big NIL story for a while, had a very good year. And you have him going number 12 overall, Houston's second pick in the first round. And in your latest mock draft. And I just kept thinking to myself, I said, you know, I think just gut feeling. Yeah. If you're a fan of the Houston Texans and you've got two picks in the top 12 and you take the best quarterback in the draft and the best wide receiver in the draft, you're throwing a parade for Nick Casario. <laughs> And I, I got the Houston Texans fans mad at me on that one because of what I said, Peter. I said, look, and I, you know, do the Charger game. So I've been to Houston twice in the last couple of years. And I said, and, and I said, keep in mind, they won, the Texans even won one of those games. But I said, not only has the team been bad, the team's been boring. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not, a, it's not a well, fun right. watch. And they got yeah. all mad at me. So, oh, we played these one possession games. I'm saying, well, then why is nobody in the stadium? Because nobody wanted to watch them. 
Uh, yeah. And all of a sudden now with, with the back and Damian Pierce, and now you bring in the quarterback and Bryce Young, and now you've got Addison, you've got one of the premier left tackles in Laramie Tunsil. Like I'm a proponent of trying to fix one side of the ball. I know they've yeah. got issues and warts all over the place, but man, you fix the offense. At least we're watchable and fun uh, yeah. while you're trying to win games. But you know, what's so weird about this, honestly, when I think about it, you know, they just the Houston Texans hired D'Amico Ryan's. Yeah. And he looks at his team and he goes, I'm telling you, if we got a chance to get, you know, if we got a chance to get one of these really good edge guys who we like, we got we got to get them. We need them. We mm-hmm. definitely need uh you know a rusher to affect uh the 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 quarterbacks of the AFC South. But when you look at it, Peter, like the- to me, the challenge is when you bring in a quarterback, when you have all these other issues on that side of the ball, and when you look at Houston, this team was 30th in points per game. They're 31st uh, in rushing yards per game. They're 31st in third downs. Like, okay, now you just drafted a quarterback, and you haven't really put him in a position where he can be successful. Mm-hmm. So I, that, that, to me, even though the warts are where they are on the defensive side of the ball, I'm trying to give my young quarterback as much help as I can possibly give him. Last question i'll ask you who's the guy who you are most intrigued with of all these guys that you think is going to or all these guys that you think are going to go in the first round who's the most intriguing prospect to you when you look at him you say man i can't wait to see where this guy goes yeah that's a great question um i'll give you one that uh, unfortunately I don't think he's going to be able to do much at the combine because he's coming off of an injury. But one that I'm, I'm very high on maybe more so than most people is Dalton Kincaid was the the tight end from Utah. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. I'm you love Dalton Kincaid, man. I, I was him. listening I love to him. you, man. And I you, love you love this guy. Yeah. And it's just, you know, and I know this is such a loaded tight end class and he's coming off of an injury um so you know again we don't know how much we're going to see him and people say oh he can't he's not going to go as high as you have him. i'm like yeah i don't really care if he goes with the 10th overall pick he's my 10th overall player if he goes with the 45th pick i'll feel great about it once we see him on nfl field making plays but you know you're just talking about usc a minute ago you watched that first game that they played against uh, against utah and i i was watching all the targets as you go through the season i'm watching all the targets on Dalton kincaid and I thought, man, I must have dozed off because I feel like I've been watching him catch balls against USC for the last 15 minutes. Like, how many catches does this guy have in this game? They, they couldn't stop him. I mean, the numbers, wow. you can pull them up. They're ridiculous. But when everybody knows where it's going and you can't do anything about it, like, that's a true difference maker. This guy was playing down the street from me at University of San Diego not that long ago. And wow. then through this whole transfer process, gets at Utah. And then, you know, kind of the tight end. They had a tight end that was – you know, highly rated gets hurt earlier in the year in Keithy, and then he gets his opportunity, and it's like, holy crud, this guy's unbelievable. Well, the amazing thing is that you have a tight end as your number 10 player, you know, on your big board right now, which tells you a lot about how much you respect Dalton Kincaid. Yeah, I I, I feel uh, I feel strongly about him, and I go back to the year – uh, when Keenan Allen came out, I think I, you know, had him as like the 18th player somewhere around there. He went in the third round, you know, some of it was injury related, but some guys you just watch him and you're like, yeah, it's an easy one to bet on. I'll bet on him. Uh, Daniel, look, I really appreciate you taking all this time. Thank you. And uh, look forward to seeing you in Indianapolis at the combine. Thanks, Peter. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.